The number one question, though, that I get in all of this is, is this going to end like the 80s? Okay? If, if, you know, if I kept track of all the questions I get, this is probably the, the number one question. This is going to end like the 80s, right? Think about it. We had a big boom. Okay, we had a big softening. There are similarities, right? There are certainly similarities with the 80s. But I think there are some really important differences. And I think that as we look uh, going forward, I don't think this is going to end anything like the 80s. But at the same time, this downturn is real. Okay, and that doesn't alleviate the need for producers and businesses that work with producers to prepare for an extended downturn period. Let's take a quick look at the next things. So, perspective. I don't know that I was a huge fan of this guy, but I thought this was an interesting quote. As we know, there are known knowns. There are things we know we know. We also know there are un known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know. But there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. Everybody got that? Okay. To some extent, I think this applies to the situation. When, I, when we look and I say this isn't going to be like this, the 80s, th there are certain things we know what caused the 80s okay, to happen. Those are the known knowns. Those are the factors we know that contributed to it. High debt, high inflation rate, land market bubble. Okay? All of those things. There are also known unknowns. Well, that to me is what's going to happen with inflation rates. What's going to happen with interest rates. Because if you go back to the 70s, and I always like to do this and think about, well, why, why is it that people didn't? see that coming because in hindsight it looks so obvious you know land prices went up incomes were going down land prices were going up all this debt it just seemed like a bad idea right but if you put yourself back in a situation it was way more complicated than that right how many people knew that interest rates were going to go to 20 percent did anybody in here get the chance to borrow money pay an operating loan back at 20 percent during that time period some of your customers did. You need to congratulate them for making it through. That's, think about how hard that is. 20% interest rates on operating debt? That was crazy. Who knew that was coming? Okay, it, it's really hard. That's, an un, that's a known unknown. We don't know for sure, but we think. And then there's those unknown unknowns, and those are things that, you know, if we knew, we couldn't even talk about. So that's his weasel way of getting out of saying, well, hell, anything can happen, right? <laughs> So let's go on and look at some of these known knowns. Look at the commodity. These are commodity prices, and this goes back to, and this is why I like to say, you, know, you go back and put yourself in the shoes of the 70s. We had a big price spike in corn, right? Here's nominal corn prices on the left, all the way back to 1960. Look at that price spike there. We went from about a dollar to three dollars a bushel. But then, actually in 84, in 80, we hit $3 again. It wasn't just straight down. We had some recovery. What was the problem, though? Well, when you look at real prices, there's the big spike. Today, if you want to make corn equivalent to how high it went in the 70s, you'd have to see corn at $13 a bushel. Okay? Did we get anywhere close to that? Nowhere, nowhere even close to that. Huge price spike. But then look at what happened here. These, these actually, this is higher than this one, isn't it, in nominal terms. But when you look at real terms, it was well below. Why? Why is that? Lots of inflation, okay? Inflation does weird things to economies, okay? And we had a lot of it in that time period, 10% inflation, sometimes greater, okay? And that really reduced uh, the value of those real corn prices. Here's our spike. It looks really big in nominal terms. In real, in real terms, is it big? Yeah, it's very big. Okay, but nothing like, like this environment. So one, we haven't had quite as big a shock as we've had. And two, we haven't had inflation. In fact, we've had the opposite. Okay, De really close to deflation in the United States. So go ahead, next slide. The other thing, this is debt. 
this is the blue is total debt. Uh, back in the 80s, we have not, and this is in real terms, total debt, real estate, non-real estate. We have not gotten back to where we were at in total debt terms, in real terms, of where we were in the 70s, or 70s and 80s. We still haven't gotten there. Now, if you put nominal debt up there, it's going up, right? And a lot of people get concerned about that. We've got to remember, you, if you're going to compare back, you have to adjust for inflation. So while debt has increased steadily, and I don't want to make light of this, it hasn't increased like it did uh, back in the 80s. The question, I think, is now what? If my colleague at Purdue, Jason Henderson, used to be at the Fed in Kansas City, uh, and he in Omaha, and he always talks a lot about this topic because he says now the the the, deci the key decision is right now. Are farms going to lever up? Are they going to lever up and keep put? Because a lot of the farmland push higher to this point has been through earnings. Okay, there was debt used. Don't let anybody kid you. There's a lot of debt used to finance some of that real estate. The red line is uh, real estate debt. It has gone up significantly. Okay, don't let people tell you it hasn't. But at the same time, it hasn't gone up as quickly. And, and what Jason is saying is now, now is the question. The earnings are gone. Are people going to keep pushing farmland prices higher uh, with more debt? And I think that's the big question. Uh, I don't think so because I think to a large extent people realize the earnings aren't there and they aren't willing to buy it when the earnings won't justify it. If we had lots of inflation, then I think people would be more willing to borrow that money, but right now we don't. So I think we're gonna moderate on debt, okay? Next one. Export. Now, when, when you think back about the 70s, one of the things that really drove us was, look at, look at this spike, this is bulk ag exports in real terms back in the 70s, this huge spike. That was a former Purdue professor who got really famous. His name was Earl Butts, and uh, he gained Secretary of Agriculture, and he did a deal with the Russians, and he sold them the entire U.S. grain reserve. Going into this, we had stockpiles of grain everywhere, right? And Dr. Butts went to Russia, and he sold them the whole U.S. grain reserve. Look at what happened to exports. And then look at what happened to exports. <laughs> Fell off the table, okay, they crashed. Why? Well, one, the Russians quit buying. Why? Well, their economy wasn't really growing. Not like China's economy. China's economy, we're talking about recession, and China's still growing 5%. Russian economy, it was a disaster, right? I mean, you used to think the Cold War, they're going to beat us, right? We're worried about it. I remember very vividly as a kid growing up and thinking about seeing those maps in the paper, and I don't know why this scarred me for life, I think. You know, the blast radius, remember those? And out in Grant, we had the Strategic Air Command in Omaha, right? And we knew that when the big one hit, that was one of the places was going to get hit. And my saving grace was that we were far enough away, we're safe, right? Grant's going to be like the capital of the new world, right? Okay? And then they put the Minutemen missiles in the panhandle and we were screwed, right? And so now we're going to get wiped out too. Think about, you know, the, the Russian economy was not growing nearly as well, and that's partly why that fell off, because they quit buying stuff and then they invaded Afghanistan and we did a ag export embargo. Remember that? Not good, okay? Former president... Jimmy Carter, who was a farmer, uh, embargoed food. I mean, it was food as a weapon. Remember those days? Okay, this was a bad thing. And the, as you look at today, what have exports done? Well, they've gone up a lot. Okay, the key difference is this is the share of ag production and exports. Back in the 80s, we hit 50% of ag production was being exported. Huge number. Very dependent on exports. Today... That number's about 30%, and it's not really terribly high in the context of history. Why is that? Well, well for one thing, we use a lot of uh, things in biofuels, right? Biofuels weren't around in the 80s the way they are today, okay? 
big, big difference. Now you take away, China falls apart and you take away biofuels, are we going to have the 80s all over again? Oh, probably. It wouldn't be pretty. Okay? Are we going to do that? I think it's pretty unlikely, okay? Pretty unlikely. So I'm not as worried about this as, as I would be. If this number were up around 50%, I would be concerned. But our share of exports is about 30%, less than 30%, so I'm, I'm not as worried about it. Next slide. The dollar. Now, this is an interesting one because this is getting a lot of press right now. This is the trade-weighted dollar. And if I took and used this from 2010, that chart would look pretty dramatic, wouldn't it? A <laughs> dollar straight up like this. Is the dollar high in the context of, say, the last 30 years? Well, not really, okay? Has it appreciated? You bet. It's hard to deny that it hasn't appreciated. This is our trade-weighted exchange rate. So this is ag stuff. Okay, and you can see it's come up, but some of this increase in the dollar is with countries we don't do a lot of ag exports with. This number has remained pretty low because what? We do a lot of business with China, and China's exchange rates are what? Fixed, okay? They have fixed their exchange. Now, they made a lot of news because they devalued their currency, but how much did they devalue it? Like 2%, okay? Not a massive measure. So part of the reason this is held pretty good is because some of our major trading partners are pegged to the dollar. If that changes, then things could get interesting. But right now, this increase in the dollar is big. It's not trivial, but it's, it's below where we were at in, say, the 80s. Okay, next slide. The other one is inflation. And yeah, it's funny. It's, so the Fed has said, what, we, how much inflation do we want? And man, I, I say that, and that gets me in a lot of trouble, particularly in South Dakota. I mean, people just are like, oh my God, we shouldn't have any inflation. Well, the Fed wants us to have 2% inflation. Why? Why did they pick 2%? It's like Goldilocks, right? We want a little bit, but not too much. And we definitely don't want zero, because if we get to zero, we run the risk of doing what? I mean, deflation. And in a deflationary environment, what do you do? If you're a consumer, what do you do in a deflationary environment? You want to buy a new pickup. You wait. You wait till tomorrow. And then what do you do? You wait. And then what do you do? You got it, right? <laughs> this guy gets an A+, plus, okay? We wait, and we don't want that, okay? We really don't. Deflation is a risky thing, because if you get it, it can really screw your economy up. So the Fed wants us to have some inflation, but they certainly don't want us to have this kind of stuff, okay? That is not good, because then things, it starts to go the other way. We get all kinds of other problems with a highly inflationary environment. Right now, this rate is what we would call persistently low, okay? And this is the headline number, and it dropped. Why did it drop so much? Well, oil prices have fallen significantly, right? Commodity prices have fallen significantly. You strip those out, it's still below where they want it. So I would say this number is continually below target, um, and we are not having anything like this. If we start to get lots of inflation, watch out. Bad problem, but we're a long ways away from having that be a problem. Next slide. Now, then the final big question is where to with economic growth? The green line is China. Let's forget about them for a second. Uh, and this goes back to 1980. The red line are emerging markets and developing economies. The orange is the world, and the blue is the advanced economies. Now, what I usually say is since 2000, where's the growth been in the world economy? Who's, whose economy has been growing? Emerging or advanced? Emerging. Emerging economies have been growing at a much higher rate than us advanced economies in blue. What's the problem today? They're still growing faster than we are, but their growth has slowed significantly. And then China is the big one in green. Now, there's real questions as to how accurate that is. This is IMF data, but I've seen other estimates show this, you know, 
when they were really growing, this was maybe up here around 20%, and now it's well below uh, this 5% that they're projecting. Bottom line, uh, there's been a lot of growth in those economies, and that's been really good for agriculture because they buy our stuff, okay? The real question to me is, can these economies get going again? And I think they have a lot of headwinds. Are they going to, is this going to flip so that they're growing slower than us? I don't think so, okay? I think we've got a long way, ways to go before that happens. Next slide. Finally, uh, the other thing I think we have to keep in mind is government payments. And th this is the thing that I think is we need caution on and we need to think about and you need to think about with your producers and your clients. In the past, this is direct government payments in yellow. You can see every time we had a big downturn, we've had big government payments, right? Back in the 80s, we had 20, you know, almost $28 billion in real terms of direct government payments. In fact, in 1982, I think it was, might have been 83, they accounted for over 60% of net farm income. The government stepped in in a big way. Today, that's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. The ARC payments that your clients all signed up for, because almost everybody signed up for ARC County, are kind of fixed. And unfortunately, they're going to start to decline. Not this year, and maybe not the year after that, but they're going to start working their way down if things don't improve. Okay? The, the government is not going to bail us out unless they change the bill, the policy. So we need to prepare because this kind of stuff isn't going to happen. Uh, like it did in the past. So that's my only caution is, you know, the government is not going to bail ag out this time. Go ahead, the next one. So what's my perspective? Normally I hide this picture, but I'll tell the story anyway. Uh, I have a friend, David, my colleague, he's from Kansas, his dad works for the Department of Roads, and he always told a story about a bad intersection in Kansas, southeastern Kansas, where he had a town with a main street and a big highway comes in, I suppose kind of like you have here, right? It comes in a high rate of speed, merges in with a slower rate, and it's been the scene of horrific accidents in the past. One day the call goes out. We've had an accident. Fire truck goes out, policeman behind it, ambulance behind them. Fire truck comes up over the hill, he calls on the radio, send every emergency responder we have. It's a terrible pileup. It's the worst I've ever seen. This is an actual picture of what he saw. Now, I know you're all like in church and you're back there far enough you can't necessarily see, but can anybody see what kind of cars those are? Those are a real picture. Those were crushed cars, okay? And so what happened? <laughs> Semi came around the curb carrying crushed cars. He tipped over, spilled them everywhere. The guy comes over the hill and he's thinking, it's going to be bad. I mean, this is a bad intersection. We've had some bad accidents here. He comes over the hill and he's like, holy cow, it's, I've never seen anything like it. <laughs> he got down there. Now, is the ag economy going to be quite that bad like that? I think there's an analogy here, okay? Now, David says there may be a real car in there somewhere, right? Maybe the car, maybe he hit a car. And there may be a few, few calamities, okay? But I, don't, I think everybody is, is set up to see the worst, and I think that we're going to make it through it. Is it going to be easy? Probably not, but if life were easy, we wouldn't all be, I mean, we live, you know, we know how to get through out here, right? I mean, the people in this area, the, you know, you know how to get by, okay? Times are not always easy in northeast Colorado or southwest Nebraska, for that matter. People know how to work hard, they know how to get by, and they know how to make do with the situation. I think we'll do that here. 